you can't really think of another event that would have more history. You know, Shane Dorian, probably the greatest quote of all time, no kook has ever won bells. You have a look at a list of winners and it's sort of the best of the best. It kind of has built a place in folklore as, as one of the most prestigious events on the tour. Bells actually, it holds up a lot to, uh, to you know, what the surf world remembers. The waves themselves have a lot of power down here. You know, it's cold and it's challenging. It humbles you. The swells could arrive really quickly and, and you know, they're really powerful. I love it cold and stormy and that's kind of what, it, what it's all about when you come down here. When you're in the water, you're just staring along uh, at these limestone cliffs. You feel like you're going back in, in time. When people roar, it's like it bounces off the cliffs and sends it out and you get really pumped. Everyone kind of hugs on the cliff and sits there and watches. It's probably the closest thing to a stadium that you'll get in surfing. It's all about the last man standing. It is all about the bell. You know, to get your name etched into that bell is... To ring that bell. <laughs> to kind of ring it's probably the most prestigious thing. It's got so much history, uh, this event. Just about every uh, great competitive surfer that's ever lived has made the pilgrimage here to Bells. As a whole, this venue, I think, is one of the spe most uh, special locations on tour because of the history of the ev event. The break is called Bells Beach because uh, the original farming family, uh, their surname was Bell, so the Bell family owned the land there, so it became known as Bells Beach. The Rip Curl Pro, um, well, when it went pro, was 1973, and, and pre that it was known as the Old Bells Beach Easter Rally. So it's got tradition and history, it's the longest running event in the world. Bells before the car park was paved was unbelievable because the whole thing was mud and cars would get bogged on the cliff here and you'd look up and there'd be like a bus, they used to drive a bus down here and that was the headquarters for the contest, a double decker bus. It was the lamest headquarters ever because it was totally freezing cold and rain would get into the bus and the judges would be sitting up there just grimacing and you could tell they were having as hard a time as the surfers. But for some reason people just kept coming back. The first year the bell was presented was 1968 and the actual origin of the, the bell trophy um, hasn't been solved completely. You look back at the history of it, MR won a few, um, Aki's won out here, Curran, Carroll, 
Simon, Damien Hardman, Barton Lynch, all world champions, you know, and that's just sort of the guys before us, really. Um, you know, you look at the modern generation, um, Parko's won, Andy's won, Taj has won, Fanning's won. Nicky Woods was arguably the one guy who wasn't in that group. He was 16 years old when he won it. He was probably the most legendary 16-year-old surfer of all time. It does definitely have, a, I guess, a lot of history and a lot of soul, I guess. So I think all the great surfers have walked down the steps there and, and competed there and surfed there in the past. When I first got introduced to Bells, it was just Aki and Current going mad. That was just um, such good surfing. You know, if those guys were doing it right now at the bowl, they'd be really, really hard to beat. That was just um, timeless. When I was a kid, you know, I used to read the surf magazines, and Bells always seemed to be big and offshore and perfect. In 1963, I came down here to Bells and uh, surfed in a contest and was uh, fortunate enough to win. It was fantastic because I'd never been in a surfing contest before, so I didn't know what it was like to even go in a contest, let alone win a contest. 12 in a final, not too like today, uh, so which made it a bit harder. The trophy I've got is Victorian uh, Board Rally, is what's on that uh, pennant. So. Just came down to watch the contest because I won it in 63 and I'm 63 years old, so. I thought it'd be a good time to come back, and uh, I've just been told that I'm going to get a replica of the bell, so that's just blown me away.
up here at Bells and the waves are a bit small so we've got a little search crew together and we're gonna, we're gonna head east. Owen forgot his board because the dumbass he is and um, looks like he's gonna have to go home and get his own when we go searching. So I got my car. Yeah, Lost a member, Matt Wilkinson, who suddenly fell sick due to stomach cramps. And then uh, we've gained a member, Stewie Kennedy. He uh, was in the main event, won the trials. It's me and, me and Matt Wilco. I see you say, as you look at the home on the right, and you say, oh, oh, I know the difference. Oh, oh, I learned the other way. Yeah. How could I be so careless? Before you know it, they'll be hoping I'll live for the truth. What about you, man? What about the day? You found the sun and another reason on the way. And you say, oh, oh, I know the death around. For a long time, we've, we've tried to do things that are, you know, be environmentally sensitive. We've got recycling programs here and we have for a long time. Our company, which is just five minutes up the road, we've planted like about 50,000 trees in the area um, over the last six years. So the way we're really trying to involve the crowd and the spectators in that event is 50 cents from every ticket that's sold to the Rip Curl Pro is going back to an organisation called Greening Australia. They will work in with local community groups and basically drive key environmental initiatives in the area. I'm the Managing Director of CO2 Australia and we're providing carbon offsets for the contest. For this event what we do is work out the carbon footprint of all the activities, so the energy consumed in running the contest, the power, uh, the transport associated with contest officials and contestants, and then we tally that at the end of the contest and work out how many tonnes of carbon dioxide have been emitted, and then we will implement and create a dedicated program to offset those emissions through tree planting. It's not just one thing that we're doing, it's, it's, it's a part of an overall plan to, to be you know, good environmental citizens. The surf industry companies now, like a lot of other large lifestyle companies, they had to come to grips with, with the question of their environmental effects and how their production methods and, and, and all that sort of stuff uh, adds to things like global warming, you know. I think that the companies and the surf industry in general is, is, is realising that people out there are becoming very aware of these things, that why shouldn't surfing take the leading role here? I mean, surfers have an affinity with the, the environment. It's the first world tour event that has been carbon offset. So, you know, we're really happy to be at the forefront of that. And, you know, if, if that's the catalyst for other events to follow suit, um, then that would be a really, a really positive thing for us, I think.
you've got to go through so many different things to win a bell. Um, you got to deal with stopping and starting, surfing the bowl, ring con, Joanna. You know, you've got to be ready for everything, and um, and then all the different elements. You know, you have 45 seasons in one day down here. The essence of bells as a contest is the same now as it's always been, which is that it's a test. You know, you know, number one thing about bells is that it's an encounter with the elements. It can get really ugly down here, like it can get really cold, smashed by wind, storms. If this is your first year here, you know, sort of, you, you might not fall in love with the place straight away. <laughs> you know, it was 100 degrees about a minute ago and now it's raining, but carry on, keep interviewing. Who cares? We're surfers. <laughs> All the events on the World Championship Tour have their own unique characteristics, and we certainly have some here. You come to Bell sort of expecting to be on hold, and, and uh, you know, you could be out in the water, and all of a sudden they, the tide gets too high, and they have to put your heats on hold or move it to Winky. But um, you just expect that. You expect to have to grind it out, and it's a challenge. It's very uh, frustrating in some ways because you don't get as many opportunities to actually just rely on your, your surfing performance to win heats. Every year at Bells you're probably going to surf somewhere else. You're going to surf it big and on shore. <laughs> Expect the unexpected for Bells because you never know what you're going to get. It's sort of like a marathon, this event, you know, it's, it never runs right away. It, it always takes a lot of time. It usually goes up and down the coast. It's Joanna all the, all the way over to Phillip Island. I mean, it really is massive logistical challenge for not only the competitors but for those running the event. I wouldn't want to be the contest director here. It's, it, it, it is a bit of a logistical nightmare with the weather and the tides. Mentally it's just like be prepared for anything, you know. Bring your wetsuits, be prepared to be cold and, and it's a really challenging event, yeah. It is an emotional roller coaster because every morning you wake up with this anticipation and hope and adrenaline and then you get to the beach and you come over the hill and the, before the sun's even rising and you're looking for lines and it's either oh, or it's oh. By the time they leave here they really know they've been somewhere, you know. It's really satisfying when you get to the end and you're holding that bell. It's a really huge achievement for sure.
too full and too inconsistent out at Bell, so we decided to move across a little bit north of Bell to Winky Pup. And the conditions are really good, it's really smooth, the wind's great. I think um, we'll see some really good surfing once we get underway. You can't really think of another event that would have more history. You know, Shane Dorian probably the greatest quote of all time, no kook has ever won bells. You have a look at a list of winners and it's sort of the best of the best. It kind of has built a place in folklore as, as one of the most prestigious events on the tour. Bells actually, it holds up a lot to, uh, to you know, what the surf world remembers. Waves themselves have a lot of power down here. You know, it's cold and it's challenging. It humbles you. The swells could arrive really quickly and, and you know, they're really powerful. I love it cold and stormy and that's kind of what, it, what it's all about when you come down here. When you're in the water, you're just staring along uh, at these limestone cliffs. You feel like you're going back in, in time. When people roar, it's like it bounces off the cliffs and sends it out and you get really pumped. Everyone kind of hugs on the cliff and sits there and watches. It's probably the closest thing to a stadium that you'll get in surfing. It's all about the last man standing. It is all about the bell. You know, to get your name etched into that bell is... To ring that bell. <laughs> to kind of ring it's probably the most prestigious thing. I've got traffic in my head. I never want to go to bed. I'm tired.
This is a unique event in that it's co-owned by Rip Curl and Surfing Victoria. Myself as the CEO of Surfing Victoria, I'm the event director, and uh, Andy Higgins and I put the thing together. The logistics and you know the complexity of putting this event together, it takes probably about six months to organise every year. We have anywhere from 120 to 180 people work on the event. We have all the grandstand infrastructure here. You know, we've got like food and drink areas, we've got beer gardens, the music concert stage, and then we have the men's and women's event all combined. So uh, it's a, certainly always, you know, there's a lot going on. It pretty much takes three weeks to build all of the infrastructure that we see here. The grandstands take about a week to put up, the buildings take about two weeks. We have to have a geotechnical report, we're building this thing on the side of a cliff. And then it takes about a week for all of the infrastructure associated with the webcast etc to be put in place. The media for Rip Curl Pro has just been growing in the last uh, five years that I've been doing the event. The biggest thing is just, I guess, the increased attention that you're getting in Australia and globally from the mainstream media. This year it was just non-stop, you know, from word go, just media, 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 and I think it's, I think it's shown in sort of the TV, radio and uh, newspaper coverage we've got so far. You know, we do the live webcast, which, uh, you know, that's, that's the biggest thing we do, obviously, is we broadcast the whole event live to uh, whoever wants to jump online and watch it. It's a pretty, pretty busy place, uh, and uh, this year, you know, the amount of exposure uh, with, with the Rip Curl Pro has meant that it's been even busier than ever. Planning for 2009 is already on the, underway. You know, that basically we're already revising what we're going to be doing next year. The event is evolving uh, and it has for some time. It's gone from you know a very grassroots, semi-disorganised event into um, you know what we call as like the Grand Prix of surfing yeah. events. The world champions have a much harder road these days. The competition's are unbelievable. You've got to have a lot more things tuned in these days. Yeah, first you've got to be a really good surfer, and then and then you've got to be able to um, adjust to all the things that are going on around. Um, and it's a lot of mental stuff as well. It's a tough road, definitely. It's hard. It's a lot of you know determination, and um, I think the guys are having fun with it, and that are focused and fit seem to do well. From knowledge of my world title, I really think it's been the people who are just enjoying the journey the most. There's a lot more to becoming a world champion than being a good surfer. You've got to be a good strategist, you've got to be adaptable, you've got to be focused, committed, disciplined. I mean, this, it all depends on, on each individual and, and how they approach the responsibilities that are aligned with being a world champion. All the guys have been world champions in the last uh, eight or ten years, you know. They've all got really different strengths and the connecting thing about them is that they've all been able to play to those strengths and declare themselves as individuals really strongly. I think everyone has a different winning style. Every guy's individual, it's just like surfing style. For me, my, my winning style is different than others for sure. I think I would get angry sometimes and it would work out for me. Andy's just hungry and angry and just refuses to lose, you know, like in his heats, which is good, that's what you need to do. A surfer like Kelly Slater, he's uh, you know, 36 years of age now and he's so sort of wise about competition and so wise about himself and what it takes to bring out his best performances. Generally a guy who wins a world title uh, just figures it out a little differently than the other guys. There's a lot of really small, intricate details of things that happen along the way that you have to uh, pay attention to. Kelly just kind of, you know, he's just, he's just got it. A guy like Mick Fanning, you know, is really focuses in on the physical and tries to advance himself and, and advance his confidence through knowing that he's physically prepared. When you see Mick competing, he's really focused and you just sort of feel like he's going to win even before he bails out. Mick's a fanatical trainer. That's part of his edge. I guess every time you, you have a heat, you're always learning too. So you just got to try and know what's good and what's not. And uh, you have definitely got to have an all-around package. I think the mental side's probably the biggest thing. I've always believed that you're not world champion until you're really ready to walk in the boots of the world champion. Yeah, I know, it was so close. Uh, it was really tricky in ours. There was hardly any um, clean ones that ran right through, and, and yeah, I just hipped him by like half a point. But it's 
hard. It's a messy and and bumpy, and you just kind of go and hope for the best. What's got you down? Tough conditions, I mean, pretty fun when you get the right one, but still, you know, you had to find that right one. I actually kind of prefer bells when it's on shore, to be honest with you. It, it, it puts a little more lip there, and it's, it's steeper through the uh, midsection. And uh, it gives you a little more option to, to really blast a lift. Morning. As you can see, it's Easter morning and the Easter Bunny's been good to everyone today. We'll barge in and see what's going on in here. Open! And see, so we have some excited people. <laughs> oh, he broke his Easter eggs. <laughs> now we've moved on to Stewie's room and I'm scared. Yes, the bunny gave me a banana. <laughs> we got a little search mission planned for today. We're gonna head down the coast and um, see if we can't find some good waves. It's like three feet. It's looking pretty clean offshore. I'm just jumping at the bit to get out there. Eh? Look, perfect one. Look at that peeler. Look at that, you get that one. There's definitely some ups and downs with the search. Most of mine have been hits, except for yesterday at Jakawatu. This is looking way better than that, so I'll count it as a hit. We found the best waves around. There's not much on offer, but um, not a CT surfer inside out there. I guess they weren't keen to search. They're just cruising, cruising the bells, having a lay day. We actually got some good little waves. It was fun, and that's it. That's how the search goes. I'm chilling at the beach uh -huh. and looking fresh. Got the board in my hand and I'm watching the sets. And yeah, I check to my left. What up? There she stood five foot damn cute, but looking mad tough. Oh, that's the stuff that makes men weak. Yo, the swell was good, but other sure was sweet. I got the stare on repeat. Oh man, the golden tan and blonde hair with the board in her hand. And then she ran into the water like a runaway dream. I had to catch that fish, man, if you know what I mean. So here's the scene. I started paddling out to tell the surfer girl, yeah, what I'm thinking about. And when I open my mouth, want some lunch at my place. She stole my way with a punch in the face. The girl's name was Candy. She had my heart on the run. Beating me up beneath the Queensland sun. Skin on my waves like death from above. Yo, surfer girl, yeah, I'm in love. Love me, she loves the waves at the beach and the shady palm trees. I take the back seat, her board rides up front. Hers is more important, cause I ride her old one. Yeah, she's a weapon, you don't wanna get too close. Was drowning when I met her and she cut off my leg, bro. Blew me a kiss and said, learn how to paddle. And ever since then, man, yeah. It's been such a long time between wins for me, it's just it's just shattering when I can come so close and blow it. 
Um, with the amount of experience that I've had over the last 18 years on tour, I shouldn't make those mistakes. I'll be prepared with myself and went on to brave the impact. Got dropped in on and she gave him a slap. Yeah, I love myself a girl because of things like that. She might beat up a dog, but she's got my back. Yeah, I mean, Sophia's a great competitor. Huh? She's a previous world champion and just an all-round, you know, amazing surfer. So um, I've got to take my hat off to Sophia and I'm sure she's going to put in a good performance in the final against Steph. Life changes when you become a world champ, I'll, uh, I'll admit it. It does, um, I mean, me personally, I don't think I've changed too much, but people just, they want a piece of your time now, and, and uh, it's, it's quite demanding, the amount of energy that you have to give back to the world, and um, I guess there's so much preparation in becoming a world champ, but nobody really prepares you for what is to come after it. Before, I sort of didn't have to do so much, where now it's a lot of media commitments, but surfing wise and how I feel is exactly the same. Once you become a world champion, your world changes forever. You know, along with being world champions, the extra scrutiny from the media, peers, you know, from the industry. Going from you know, number two in the world to number one in the world is night and day. And so when you're number two in the world, you've got everybody gunning for you, everyone telling you that you can do it, and there's no expectation or pressure on you. Then you win it. Then you've got the whole world gunning at you because no one wants to see a champion win. To win um, a world, t world title is amazing, but to back it up is definitely the hardest thing by far. Just because there's so much focus on you and it's more like a big bullseye on your back all year long. Whenever you hit the water, everyone's watching what you're doing. It's just a lot of pressure. Sometimes it gets a bit much, but you know, it's part of the job and you just gotta do it. You know, as long as I've got enough time to go surfing and do the things I still enjoy, then you know, it's easy. But when when things get like the the media starts taking over surfing, that's when I get annoyed. Obviously, you, you gain these responsibilities, you become a role model, and, and you become, um, you know, you're in the eyes of the public. So, you know, I've had advice from different crew, and, and Mick, especially, you know, he's been in a, a similar situation all year, and uh, just about enjoying yourself and making sure you, you really take out time to um, do the stuff that you, you love to do. just amazing and it was such a good final and Steph is just such an amazing surfer and it just feels good you know to win a final again and yeah I'm just stoked to go back home too for the big break. Belgium 
was pumping today and um, and the girls get to surf it, so it was just oh, an incredible day. To win here at Bells is such a special place, and uh, wow, well, I just can't believe it. <laughs> the big brass bell. It is all about the bell. Just that noise of that bell. Ding, ding, ding. If you get one of those bells, and uh, you're doing pretty good. Once you've seen other guys do it, you totally want to do it. I really want to ring that bell. <laughs> Wrong is a cow. You know, it doesn't ring all year. It only rings for when the guy who wins it. It's supposed to bring bad luck to anyone who rings the bell if they haven't actually won it. The bell's always been uh, one of very few really iconic things that you could claim and part of it is just the fascination of actually being able to ring it, you know. <laughs> it's just something that captures the imagination. Because it's the longest running event probably in the world um, and the list of past winners is pretty prestigious. Everyone wants to ring that bell, everyone wants to be on the, have their name on the bell. There's no other trophy in surfing that represents what an event stands for. The bell itself, the trophy hasn't tra changed in all those years, it's pretty special. It's probably one of the biggest trophies we have on the CT. I suppose it's that big just to fit all the names that have had on there, past winners. All of the bells have been made right from the beginning by uh, local surfer Joe Sweeney, who's now in his mid-70s. The big trophy weighs over 30 kilos. Yeah, the thing's so heavy, I almost dropped it when I did. I tried to pick it up over my head because I was so excited, but I almost tipped over and you know, lost the whole thing. So it can be a pretty stressful one. I don't know how Taj did it. <laughs> I can't remember exactly what I did. I know the best way to give it a good ring is when you're holding it right here and just wring its neck. <laughs> I think everyone struggles with it. You know, you're covered in champagne and it's things slippery and it's heavy. I think it's nearly been dropped every year. I knew it was going to be heavy because I remember Mick saying it was heavy because I remember he couldn't really lift it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was, I was a pinner back then. So, uh, yeah, I was too little to lift it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a man's man, you got to lift this thing. <laughs> I remember getting it up there, you know, and trying to get the shake going, you know, trying to get the whole thing going. The first thing I remember looking at was the list of names, you know, as soon as I kind of put it down and I gave it a few more rings and I looked at the list and I was just like, wow, you know, I couldn't believe my name was there. To get your name on that list is, um, is pretty special and that's why I said, you know, it is all about the bell. I mean, these guys tough it out through very, very difficult conditions down here and, um, Every day is a major challenge, but it's all about the last man standing. It's not like the best wave in the world or, or on tour, but everybody wants to win the bell. It is such a challenge, and I think that's why everybody wants to win it, because when you do it, it's really deserved. I'm a little bit disappointed but I'm over it now, he, he deserved to win and, and he went for it a bit harder than I did and, but I'm stoked with making the final and it's been a great start to the year. To get that close to be in the final and have a chance at it and, and uh, not get it would be, 
I definitely not feel great. And, you know, I, knew, I do have a couple, but, you know, to get there and have the chance to get a third was, felt good. You know, the bell is just arguably the best trophy you could ever win in surfing.